Hi, right, Dan. Thanks for doing this with me. No worries, man. No worries at all. Yeah, um, I've been recording some conversations around grief, and I've done some with men and mental health. And uh, I thought a good place to start. We know each other from from the gym, don't we? And yeah, we had quite a powerful conversation the other day in in, in the changing room. And um, you had your towel on, then you were waiting to get in the shower, so it wasn't. Yeah, the old half naked conversations in there are the best ones, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, just for anyone watching who doesn't know who Dan Sargison is, he used to play for Salford and England uh, rugby league player. Um, so yeah, we, we we were talking like on the most serious note that um, we were talking about our experience of trauma, weren't we? Yeah, man. Yeah, uh, and um, we've both got a powerful connection there, really, because I I had to do CPR on my mum and, and watch my mum die, and that gave me PTSD. And you lost your brother, didn't you? Yeah, I think we shared pretty similar stuff in terms of um, we both experienced seeing something. <laughs> We're going straight in at the depths, but I suppose we both experienced something that we saw that we that we didn't necessarily want to see and that was pretty tough for us to process and yeah i think i think it takes a lot of undoing doesn't it, it takes a lot of undoing and from what you were saying um having to do cpr on your mom and, and watching her pass away um yeah it's something something that you you experience but it doesn't just go away and it's it's kind of a process isn't it it's kind of and you just hit a nerve there, Dan, because I not thought that for a while. It was something I didn't want to say. And while it was while it was happening, I remember thinking to myself, why is this happening to me? And yeah. Thought, yeah. And it was the tapping stuff that got you through it, wasn't it? Yeah, because I had feelings of guilt because I had all these thoughts going on in my head. Um, and we connected with this as well, didn't we, where everyone said how brave I was. But I, I didn't feel like I was brave. And I had a lot of guilt associated with some of the thoughts that was going through my mind. And um, I started to think there was something wrong with me. And then we did a really powerful tapping session with a therapist and said everything that was going on in my mind while I was doing CPR. Yeah. And we were doing it for about 20 minutes. And every so often she'd say that this is a normal response in a trauma. Yeah. And then guilt just went. Yeah. Does it does it help you doing it there now? Then does it does it yeah, ease you every time you do it now? Because you've got that that intention associated to it. Um, it helps me with everyday stress. Uh, it it gives me something to do. Like if I'm lying awake at night, then it gives me something to to yeah mind body connection. Uh, and then I think I think things like flashbacks. Um, because the whole trauma was six hours, then I've learned to live with it. Um, mm. And they don't, at first, they would completely overwhelm me. Um, I think the last time I had a flashback that threw me a bit was in a yoga class at David Lloyd. Really? Yeah, and it was Mother's Day. And um, well, I always like to talk about the love of a mother. And um, it, when I closed my eyes, I could see mum dying. And, uh, and I thought, I'm going to have to leave the room. But I just felt, well, I've been in this situation before. And yeah. Got through it. It's kind of like something you, you learn to live with. And it becomes a part of you. But for a long time, Dan, it became who I was. Mm. I was a traumatised person. Yeah. And that's who Paul Banks was. And then at some point, um, uh, someone, I think a therapist said to me that, that don't let the trauma define who you are. Yeah. Um, and it's just become a a part of me and I thought it was really powerful I, I really connected what you were saying that you played a rugby match days after your brother died didn't you mm. so you got a standing ovation didn't you yeah, how, yeah. how did that feel um yeah I think with what we were chatting about I think people were I think what we, we came to the conclusion of was the people would were, were kind of congratulating me and saying saying how tough it was how tough it must have been to play a few days later but and and how strong I was but look at the time yeah I thought I was strong I thought I was doing the right thing but I I, I really think looking back the strength would have been in 
stepping back and giving myself the time to process it because listen I played the game and I wouldn't change it for the world but it was it was a form of escapism for me it was somewhere where I could go out and get lost in the game for 80 minutes and and not really think about the death of my little brother so um yeah I suppose yeah I suppose it was strong I suppose it was strong in a way but I, f- I feel like the stronger option for me personally would have been to to sit and process that them emotions and them feelings and perhaps connect with my family who were feeling a pretty similar way. But um, yeah, I suppose, I suppose we, we go through these and we look back on them and we, we extract different, uh, different things to what we experienced back then in the moment. I think, I think back then I, I, I never really know, knew how to process my emotions and anything that would kind of occur in my life. That would, that would be my, my instinct to numb it with something, whether that be rugby or drugs or alcohol um and yeah I suppose the the latter part of my life has been trying to connect back in and actually feel my emotions the 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 beautiful thing about being a human being is there's such an array of emotions that we're we're here with with to feel and our bodies are always talking to us and it's about sometimes being strong and leaning into that feeling and and working out kind of what's on the other side of it and processing it and um as opposed to running away from it, I think. And I think something like grief opened you up to the full spectrum of emotions, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I truly believe I've kind of gone full circle with grief where uh, for, the, for the longest period of time, it was all kind of, why me? Why has this happened to me? And uh, you only ever read about this happening to other people. But then, um, I don't know, I kind of view grief now and kind of traumatic experiences as, as uh, opportunities to grow and become resilient and overcome adversity. And then through gaining that strength and that power within, with overcoming something like that, it's, it's, it's then, it's then just as rewarding and powerful to then um, hold space for others and and help others who are, who are potentially experiencing the same thing. So I'm a true believer that you can always find, find positives within something. I don't think the overall experience was a positive experience, but, I do think that there's elements of of positives you can extract from from any situation. Yeah, there's a, there's a saying that kept me going, and it's post traumatic growth, where you can grow out of a trauma, and it can take a long time. It, it's took me so maybe three or four years. Yeah. Uh, then new people come into your life, you develop new skills, uh, and I, Greater Manchester Mental Health have a. Course is called the Recovery Academy, and uh, I do an EFT tapping course for them. And, uh, I did it. It was six. I've done two this year, and I did one six weeks after my dad died. And I thought I'm not going to be able to do this. But then I'm stood up in front of a room of people, and I'm honestly telling my experience of how it helped me. And um, you know, there's no bullshit. I'm not trying to sell them anything or. or mm. And then people are asking me questions and then everything I'm saying is genuine and I'm helping people. Mm. Amazing feedback. And um, I, I have grown these things like I used to hate my voice and, and um, I used to lack confidence and used to think I was too sensitive. And, and I think they're the good things about me now. They're, they're yeah. the sensitive side to me. And the vulnerable side of me allows people to feel safe to open up to me. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I I truly I truly believe that on the other on the other side of some of our deepest fears is usually our superpower, is usually our our strength. And and so for you on the other side of of feeling like you're too sensitive, no, that's that's what the world's out there to tell you. That's what. That's what society tells you. It's like, oh, you're too sensitive, toughen up and get on with it or whatever. And, and you become conditioned and you you sometimes drift so far away from who you truly are. No, you're no, you're just an empathetic soul and you you have the ability to feel other people's pain. And like you said, that that helps people to feel uh, safe in in your space. And that's why you get so many beautiful people agree to come on on this um on this video call with you and open up and yeah. Yeah. And share their experiences, because because otherwise, if you if you if you didn't give off that sort of energy, that sort of 
um, who you truly are, then then pe people wouldn't agree to come on it. It's beautiful. Well, is it like yeah, you know, like like talk about vulnerability, and you obviously someone who's exploring being in touch with emotions, and and um, I bet it must have been hard in the rugby environment because that must be very like you know you need to be hard and. Um, yeah, yeah, I think I think that environment. Um, I was reflecting on this the other day and I think it just kind of reinforced the, the, the beliefs I had about myself where um, it, it was it was kind of like a physical representation of my emotions in a way. So like so like as I was playing, you'd get injured and it was like play on, play through it, jab it up, local anesthetic in your ribs and carry on, just numb it and carry on. And it was it was kind of weird. It was exactly what I was doing to myself with drugs and alcohol and keeping myself busy and all these other um, distraction techniques. And um, it, it was the same thing kind of manifesting itself within rugby and outside of rugby. So it's interesting now you mentioned with the yoga and the yoga now is it's like a different chapter in my life where, like I said, I'm, I'm starting to kind of feel into my body and listen to my body as it's communicating with me whether that's digestively whether it's my emotions whether it's a gut feeling that I just need to kind of put my trust into whether what direction I want to go in life um our bodies are constantly talking to us and it's it's getting beyond the mind the mind the one thing that's that's kind of controlled and run our whole lives and is susceptible to to this um to this deceptfulness and this you know, the programming that from society and stuff, and it's getting kind of with the meditative stuff and the yoga, getting beyond the mind, feeling into the body and um, and trusting that there's a lot of wisdom in there. There's a lot of, um, the answers are usually in there beyond beyond the mind that will just go back and forth. And, and um, I and believe it, that- like, you a lot of stress. Yeah, we, we, like just touching what you said there, with meditation, then I've been going to Manchester Body Centre for about <clears throat> 10 years now. Oh, cool. Meditation classes there and, and I've been on retreats. And, and um, I mean, I already had tools in place to not drive myself to suicide or anything when I had that trauma. But meditation, whenever I did a breathing meditation, I would see my mum dying um, and I was like that probably for a year um, and they told me like to open your eyes and touch the floor when it happens and, and sometimes I'd come up I'd go home and leave but I kept going and, and I kept it up and, and I didn't stop meditating and it was absolute torture at times but I think it helped my brain process it I yeah think it you process the trauma and I think there's something really beautiful in, in just sitting mm. um, and just being with your breath yeah and i think you learn so much about yourself yeah when you meditate and you do things like yoga yeah well i think we're we're just we're just kind of especially me like my mum was always busy my mum's always out mowing the lawn or cutting the hedge or cooking or dropping us places i i never really got to witness um anyone be still and just be be with themselves and 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 even just to try and observe my thoughts, I'd get caught up in my thoughts and all my thoughts were pretty negative. So I was just living in this world inside my mind that was just, that was just chaos. Yeah. And the, the meditation, one, uh, like I find once I, once I observe my thoughts and accept my thoughts, like for a long period of time, I was to meditate and these thoughts would arise and I'd pick and choose which ones I wanted to think and wanted not to think. And it was like, no, accept it all. They're all happening. They're all, all your thoughts are there based upon a past experience. And it's just a big program and a big data set. And it's like, observe it. And the more you observe it and accept it, the quieter it gets. And it's in that quietness that you can really start to feel and you, you feel that peace, don't you? You feel that, uh, you feel that contentness, I suppose. Um, the one thing that the ego and the mind can't comprehend, it can't, it, it struggles to get there, doesn't it? It struggles yeah. to be. Yeah, and I, I, I think like I'm obviously not glad that mum died, and I'm not glad that my dad died. Uh, but a part of me is glad that I've had that experience of grief because it, I, mean, I was going to experience it at some point in my life. Um, I, I went, with my mum, it was horrible because it was sudden; it happened in front of me. And, and, and but with my dad, it felt a lot 
kinder and, and I was with him at the end and I held his hand for four days. But it's totally changed me as a person. It's yeah. totally changed me. And it's made me, well, it's made me a better person. It, it has. I'm more open to, to experiences and more. I've realised that life ends um, and, and I've seen it end for people. And do you know, like, like um, I probably said this on other videos, I? so I might be repeating myself here, but I view success as different now. So I, in an early video with my mate, Sean, we were talking about like, you could be a billionaire flying around in a helicopter, but you could die on your own scared. Mm. And I thought with my dad, he had me holding his hand for days, me telling him I loved him. And mm. I thought, well, you know, how rich is he? Yeah. It's things like that matter. It's like yeah. you have all the money in the world. Um, you know, I'm like, you're one of the good guys. Most of the people are, but like sometimes like places like an expensive gym, people are, people can be arrogant, can't they? And they have a flash car and then that's what it's all about for them, like the biggest house. But it doesn't mean anything, does it? No. And I think, yeah, I think, I, I don't know, I suppose I've gone on a journey, I suppose, that you mentioned the, the maybe the arrogant people. And, and I suppose it's just... Um, potentially just a lack of understanding around what they are, who they are, and perhaps that money isn't making them happy and they feel guilty that they've, that they've worked their whole life towards that or they've, or yeah. they've put so much on that that they haven't got their relationships or their, their friendships or, or, the, or they're, they're acting a certain way that isn't who they truly are. And so they're, so they're upset and that they're a bit angry at the world. And sometimes we're on the receiving end of that. And, I suppose the deeper you look into, the deeper you kind of search, the more you realise. I, I love the concept of of everyone coming to this world as like a blank slate. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I think it's something Laura give me, and it's like, it's like then then the, the certain things happen to them that made them a certain way and made them made them potentially strive towards certain things to make them happy. And I suppose life's just the journey of of kind of coming back to who we truly are and um realizing what we do to, to, to that potentially we, we do it solely just to impress other people which might might be the money might be the cars and stuff you allude to the gym maybe or um and i feel like everyone's on their own journey and whether people know it or not um it's about honoring that i suppose and accepting everyone's everyone's at where where they need to be and i think it's brought me a lot more peace i think um I kind of used to walk around and I used to get annoyed at a lot of people, but, but upon reflection, and I used to point the finger and, and be like, he's this, he's that, she's this, she's doing. It. And upon reflection, it was always just whatever I was getting annoyed at. It was, it was just a beautiful mirror for me to, to analyze what it was, what it was within me that um, was being triggered and just a great opportunity for me to heal that part of myself and, and find more peace. Like the more we heal them, them areas of ourselves, the more peace we find, the more content we find. And, and I think that's where people allude to the word happiness. I think that's where you find a lot more happiness. I don't, I don't think that's a, a state that we'll feel forever. I feel like we're still, like we said, we're still meant to feel every emotion, but it's how we process that, extract the wisdom, move on, find lessons within challenging events and grow and fulfill our, fulfill our greatest potential. Do you know, like, talk about happiness, like, like, I remember, I've heard a couple of people say, but, like, someone at Manchester Body Centre said one of their friends was dying, and they went to see him every day in hospital, and then in their moments, they had moments of real happiness, and I thought, how could you possibly be happy if your friend's dying, like, you know, and I, yeah. thought, I don't know why people say things like that. Now, when I was with my dad for four days, I mean, it, it was obviously like really sad at times, but then at times I was thinking, how special is this? Yeah. Like, you know, most people don't know when it's going to happen and they don't get the opportunity that I've got now. And, and then there was times when I was playing in music. There was times when I would say stuff because he couldn't speak. He had like dementia level seven at the end. And, um, but every so often he clenched my hand. Oh. And it's like, you know, that, that yeah. felt so powerful. 
Um, and, and I totally, I totally see happiness and success and, and um, yeah, like good qualities in people. I see it all different now. And, and I'm curious for you, Dan, because you're, you're on a mission life journey yourself now. What started it? Was there a changing point for you? Um, or was it gradual? No, well, I think it's a good question. I suppose I think um, I was striving for more and more uh, in terms of my rugby career, and always thought happiness was was waiting for me after I after I would achieve something else that was in the future. I'd achieve something, and then it would be on to the next goal, and 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 I'd reset my goals and. I'd look for that. And, and if there was an emptiness within me, it was because I hadn't achieved my goals. But yeah. then once I got to a stage where I felt like I, I had achieved most things, I mean, I, I wasn't the greatest player in the world, but I played for my country and I, I played in the NRL, which was the toughest competition in the world and was on, was on the most money I'd ever been on. And at that point, I valued money so much more. I thought the money was going to make me happy and give me unlimited freedom to do whatever I wanted to do. But um, I suppose that's where the that's where I hit kind of rock bottom. That's where I hit a bit of depression. And then uh, I still couldn't really find the strength to, to understand, to, to go deeper and understand myself a lot deeper. I, I couldn't find the answers. I weren't being honest with myself. I, I was still angry at the world. Everyone, it was everyone else's problem. It was never my problem. I, I couldn't be told if, if I was doing something wrong, someone would tell me and it was just like, Oh, whatever, that's your issue. And, I don't know. I just wasn't ready, and and everyone gets to a certain stage where they're ready. And for me, I feel like when I lost my little brother, um, I, I really wanted to understand what what led him down his path of of drug addiction, and and I found it a lot easier to investigate what had happened with my little brother as opposed to myself. But um, yeah, as as I as I kind of explored that area, I, I kind of found out a lot about myself through understanding my little brother and I suppose it was then where I had a decision where I was like I can live like this for the rest of my life or I can I can start to be deeply honest with myself which which there's a lot more pain there, there's a lot more resistance there there's emotions that I really don't want to feel there's uh memories or, or certain certain belief systems that I don't want to confront and I'd I'd rather stay in my comfort zone and drink every weekend and take drugs and numb it all but I don't know I was sick of that model sick of that way of living and um yeah, I suppose I suppose it was my little brother passing away that that helped me to find the strength um, to to really start to understand myself and and go to therapy and speak to someone and lay down that armor and being in that rugby environment for so long, it's not many people speak about their feelings in there, and it. Um, it I think it'll change. Of, yeah, I think that'll change. I hope so. I hope so. I've. Um, I hope so. I feel like I feel like even speaking to Matty Pete, the Wigan Wigan head coach, Matty's doing some amazing work on himself and open his mind to new possibilities. And um, he, he he seeks mentoring outside of rugby, and he's con constantly trying to develop himself and his family life and his relationships. And I feel like we need more coaches because coaches are so so important because they drive the culture. Um, yeah. They have such a huge influence that that if these coaches have, have access to to certain methods where they can um, they can open their mind and start to explore new new possibilities and and perhaps perhaps kind of move away from this fear based coaching where um, it's all fear and outcome based and and I don't know I I personally believe in like a deeper connection building that vulnerability and getting players to open up and feel safe to open up and creating that environment where you, you truly are a family, a family of men and you, you, you got that massive support network. And I, I feel like from that place, I feel like teams will not only become so much more successful, but um, yeah, I feel like the, the individual players will just grow so much more in that environment. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's more, it's more and more with footballers, Talk, talk about depression and alcohol. Like Gascoigne's a famous one, isn't he? And, um, Stan Colin Mosey. Um, but yeah, like, like you just traditionally view 
rugby is like a hard block sport, though. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's really refreshing to hear someone open and talking about the feelings, and and there will be there will be someone out there who watched a video or one of your talks, and then it'll help them. Yeah, we're, we're, we're only human, man. It's like it's the, the name of a rugby player, as soon as people hear rugby player, it's like we have, we have a preconceived idea about people and it's perhaps that's how they're acting. Perhaps people are, perhaps people act up to that. But if you really, if you spent a week with anyone and, and got deep enough with them and it, perhaps if you were vulnerable enough with them and it gave them permission to open up themselves, I'm pretty sure at the bottom of it, there's there's a there's a good guy in everyone, and and I love the people within the sport. That's what kept me in the sport for so long. Um, just 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 the people in there, but ultimately, I, I don't know. I it sounds a bit out there, but I, I just think every human just wants that wants connection, just wants to be loved, wants to be accepted. Um, and, and yeah, I, I I suppose in terms of that, in terms of that phrase, I just blurted out it's like rugby might be a long way away from that but um it, it's it's beautiful in a way it, it just just shows there's a lot of growth to, to be had not only in sport but within schools and um within all these sort of places just just more connections as human being and, and less less division like i believe this and you believe that is like so that no we're, we're all just human beings we're all just here to to try and find peace and enjoy ourselves and and um, and yeah, I, ju I just think we're so detached from that. I think we're so detached from that fundamental idea that we all are, we are all the same thing. Yeah, and it, I, I think it's really. I mean, I did it. I had to leave my counselling course when my dad died, but I um, I did it for a year and a half, and uh, I've got used to giving people space and letting people talk, and it's beautiful. Like, and, and a lot of the time we judge people, don't we? And uh, I've been in men's talking circles. I go, I'll give them a shout out. It's called Mandem. And uh, they meet at Transcend Studios. And then sometimes I sit there and it's all blokes. And, and I think, well, they're not going to say anything deep. They, they look like typical lads. And then as soon as they start talking, it's like, wow, this guy's really deep. Uh, yeah. And, yeah, I'm just amazed at like how 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 much they share and how articulate people are and, and a lot of the time we, we just judge people don't we and i find that with meditation how it's changed me is that i don't fall out with people as much uh, yeah. and i think that a lot of the time it's me it's me like like i i try not react so if i'm angry but or pissed off about something then i try and just think what's happening in me and um and I, I don't send that text message and then yeah I think well maybe yeah maybe I'm overacting here yeah yeah well it is crazy isn't it because we're, we're, we're never perfect we're never perfect so it's like people will still people will still say things to us where our initial reaction our, our mind goes straight into that how can I get one back over him or and it's I suppose it's just with meditation, it's increasing that awareness, isn't it? The whole yeah. time you're increasing your awareness because you're becoming aware of your breath in the present moment. So for doing that, you're kind of you, you kind of teeing yourself up for in the moment when when someone really triggers you to you've got that increased awareness to be like, oh, hang on a minute, let me see it from out here and not get caught up in the anger in here, but let's see this from above and and realize that oh, okay, that they're, they're just angry because of this and it's it's kind of their issue and I don't need to. I don't need to react because that's not going to get us anywhere. And it's it's a process. It's, it's not something, it's not something you're exposed to and and it becomes your belief system and it becomes how you can operate in every situation. But um I believe everything is just a process of um like widening that window of when something happens, you've you've got more of a choice of options of what you can what you can come back with. And and eventually if, if you can come back with love, it's or a loving response it, it just kind of disarms the whole situation but when you've got two people going at each other oh my god that was the story of my life I would just be just tit for tat and you're getting more and more spiteful and you're just trying to protect yourself but at the same time you, you don't realize how much you're hurting someone and, and I think like and one reason I've been really keen to do videos about grief is that people don't talk about it so I remember that one person and I, I'll be careful I won't 
Um, and they won it. Um, but they were horrible behind my back. Now, when my mum died, I was really open about grief. And I, to be honest, I was completely overwhelmed. And I, I, I got obsessed with Facebook and I was mentioning it quite a lot. And people were, new people came into my life. And then I found out this one person was being a real bitch behind my back. And, um, and I, t- I remember t- talking to someone at Manchester Buddy Centre and um, they put a new angle on it and they said, well, this person hasn't dealt with their grief. So when when if you can't deal with grief and you don't get any support and then you see someone else dealing with it and getting therapy and talking about it, then you get angry at that person. Mm. Um, a, a lot of the time, yeah, a lot of the time we put our own stuff onto other people. Yeah, of course. Not dealing with our own stuff. If, if yeah, happens. of course we do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, even even the word mental health to someone who hasn't really experienced it, um, sometimes or or, the, or they haven't acknowledged that they've got certain issues of their own, kind of triggers people. Like, I, I mean, this this video. If I, I'm sure, if you showed this video to to absolutely everyone, some people would just toss it aside as rubbish and. And I suppose because because our intention is so pure to put this video out and if one person listens to it and, and it really gives them a sense of like, wow, okay, I feel exactly the same way and there's a there's a glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel for them, then then what we've done is, has been worthwhile and meaningful, hasn't it? Yeah, massively, yeah. Massively. I, I always lose track of the time. But I think we're at half an hour now. And um, yeah, man. How long you got? Well, I, I feel like... People will only watch them for so long, won't they? So I could talk for two hours now. <laughs> no one's going to watch them. Half good with me, man. If, or if you want to go to 40, whatever, whatever man, I'm easy. I, I'll, um, Would you feel like half an hour is good? Yeah, I think it's a good time for... Um, so, like, I never edit these as well, but, like, I just like for anyone watching, Dan, I, I always like to end it, like, what advice would you give to anyone? watching who may be struggling with grief or mental health um i suppose i suppose the I suppose the key one is um undoing undoing the idea that there's there's strength in dealing with it on our own and i uh, hear it so much within my family and and f- through through other people it's like no i know i'm trying to be strong i'm trying to be strong i don't want to cry i don't want to do this i don't want to talk about it i'm I, i'm i'm okay i'm okay and it's we've kind of been taught that there's strength in dealing with it on your own. And, and yeah, it, yeah, it is strong to some degree because, because you, you, you're battering yourself. It's like self-harming and it's um, in a way, and, it, and, and the real strength is in, is in finding, finding the, the vulnerability within you and, and, but, but finding the right person, finding, finding someone safe you can speak to, finding that one person and being brave, feeling the fear arise and observing the fear and, and understanding that on the other side of that fear, there, there'll be a lot of weight that can be lifted off your shoulders through, through I don't know, finding a loved one and, and really expressing how you feel to the depths with someone you truly trust and someone who isn't going to use this sort of information against you or, 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 or like, like a therapist, do you understand therapists? That's their job. They're very empathetic people. And, and uh, ultimately, they're there to listen to you and, and hold your hand through some of some of your darkest moments, which we've all experienced. Um, so, yeah, I, I think just we redefining what strength is in terms of trauma and, and there, there's there's incredible strength in vulnerability and and opening up and um, yeah, share, sharing truly how you feel. Um, and it can be quite liberating. Yeah, quite liberating, but yeah, you know what I mean? I absolutely love that, and I, I'll just add to that, and it's like, I think there's got to be an element of, I never said a word, like stoicism, so there's got to be an element of like, when my dad died, I've, I've had some experience of grief, and it's like, there's only me that can get through this, I've got mm. to, part of me has to toughen up, but I, I, I acknowledge that I, it, grief is so big, that I can't deal with on my own. So these yeah. times when I've been having therapy and I've been doing things like yoga and, and, and I recognise that I do need support. And, and there's a part of it that I have to do. There's only, I have to do it myself. I, there's only me that can get through it, but I do need to reach out and get support. Yeah, 
and 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 just just because it's come to me on the back of that, it's like something I didn't do for a while. I went to therapy for a long time and just just wasn't honest with myself. So I, I just wasn't getting anywhere. And and also just to reiterate, so there's strength in vulnerability, but there's also strength, amazing amounts of strength and courage in in being deeply honest, yeah. being deeply honest with yourself and. And, and in the honesty, it will arise behaviours, certain behaviours that we've potentially picked up, which we don't like about ourselves, which, which we can change. Like the, these things aren't with us forever. We don't, we don't need to be angry people forever or we, we just need to understand ourselves a bit more and, and forgive ourselves. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think, I think the honesty side of thing is, is amazing. And, and, and people, people become honest when they're ready, when they've, when they've kind of had enough of the suffering or whatever and, then sometimes the honesty comes to the surface, but the sooner you can be deeply honest with yourself and, and like I said, take off the armour and, and really open up to someone, I, I think that's the start of, of your healing journey, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, thanks so much, Dan. I'm, I'm going to hit stop record now. Uh, cool, man. Catch uh, you later. It's been an absolute pleasure, Dan. Thank you, mate.